On Stage Podcast with Chris Robert. Well, thank you very much for joining us on the platform this evening, Rachel. Thank you. Have, Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. I have never had an Australian singer-songwriter <laughs> living in the U.S. before. I've had Australian oh, wow. singer-songwriters and I've had yeah. singer-songwriters living in the U.S. and Canada, but n- not an Australian singer-songwriter living in the U.S. Love the well, accent. Well, first time for everything, I suppose. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, everyone, as well, for joining us. We have a very, very special Australian singer-songwriter, as mentioned. Her name is Rachel Lincoln, and she's been singing her whole life. And she started her professional career as a musician back in Perth, Australia, which is 12 hours ahead from us. And as a vocalist in a cover band, an acoustic duo performing in casinos. Want to hear about that? (laughs) At (laughs) weddings and at corporate events. Uh, She wants to take things to the next level. She decided to focus fully on developing as an original artist. And she started out writing electro pop. I like to ask about that. So she started writing out electro pop tracks and has placed as a finalist in the Song of the Year International Songwriting Contest in the dance category. However, she has since made a transition in new country pop. Now, Rachel, thank you for joining us. Yes, no, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. It's nice to meet you. How did your early life experiences shape your aspirations and career choices? Well, oh, good question. So I've been singing since I was a child. When I was in primary school, I was part of a um, a theatre company in my hometown doing, you know, musicals or stage shows, that kind of thing. So music's always been uh, a special part of my life. And the older I got, the more I found myself getting more and more, you know, intrigued by music. And, you know, at high school, I was part of my school music program. And then came the time when I was finishing high school and I had to decide, all right, what am I going to do at university or college? And, you know, I wanted to do something in the arts, you know, ideally music, but a lot of influences at that time, you know, parents, teachers, you know, were telling me, well, that's not a real job. You need to go and get, you know, educated in a, in a real field and you can have music as a hobby in your life, but that's not a real job. And I thought, well, you know, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. So young and impressionable me listened to their silly advice and I went and did business, business law at university, finished that, came out, worked in a law firm and law firm and thought, well, this is definitely not what I want to be doing and made the, the decision after some time overseas. I went back to Australia and I, I started um, performing and became a cover musician and, and that was great. It was great to be able to make a living out of music and performing was wonderful at the beginning but being a cover musician got pretty old fast for me doing the same repertoire the same set list every night kind of got a little bit boring and i thought well if i'm going to be doing this you know and having music as as my job then i've got to be singing my stuff i don't want to be singing other people's stuff so i'm a bit of a risk taker and i uh yeah i thought okay well i've got to do it i need to know so i packed up everything at home and um, came out to the US about 18 months ago to try and, you know, have a crack at it. And a year and a half on, I'm still here and, and things are going pretty well. So I'm happy with the progress so far. There's a lot of great singer songwriters and musicians and bands that, that started in Australia. But we know that you've been singing your whole life. But why a cover band? Can you give us an idea? The cover band, acoustic duo, what kind of songs did you sing? And was it mostly Australian bands or? Uh, Back in Perth, which is um, the capital city of my home state in Western Australia, Perth doesn't really have an original, well, much of an original music market. The music scene in Perth is mainly, you know, cover gigs and, and wedding singing and that kind of thing. So I sort of had to cut my teeth on being a cover musician. And uh, it was great. You know, I had I had a, a bunch of booking agents and, you know, they would they would book me solo gigs, just me and the ukulele sometimes, believe it or not. People actually wanted that. <laughs> and then other times um, I performed in duo 
with a, a male singer who was also a pianist and we would do sort of lounge sort of you know easy listening stuff wedding singing corporate events so it was i would say the the band it was a six piece band and we we had a pretty interesting concept so rather than doing individual songs every set of ours every 45 minute set was actually one massive medley so we would do we would do probably like verse chorus bridge of a song and then it would actually run into the next one and the next one and the next one so it was this massive run on set and all songs would you know really seamlessly move into the other so that was a bit of a novelty and i think you know audiences loved that because they didn't know what was coming next and you know one song would sort of blend into another one so that that was pretty cool um it took a lot of refining though because you've got six people you know and, and you all have to be bang on you know when you transition the song mm. right so it was a lot of work um but it was good so that was kind of like top 40 pop rock the duo the acoustic duo was easy listening jazz sort of stuff and then me on the ukulele was anything from top 40 to somewhere over the rainbow you know all kinds of stuff whatever whatever you know was requested and what was wanted yeah wow i'd like to ask you about when you're performing casinos I know a friend of mine was a bouncer in our Falls View Casino, which is in Niagara Falls here. And he said he's seen everything. And he says that whenever you go there or to any casino, there's always these young women that are hanging around waiting for a guy who won quite a lot of money (laughs) and hang out with them. Because, you know, a girl always wants a rich guy. So when you were performing in a casino, and we all want to know, number one, were you hit on guys? And number two, what did you do about it? (laughs) Did I hit on the guys or did the guys hit on me? Yeah, the guys hit on you. Yeah, yeah, look, so that did happen. So quite a few times, you know, it would would be pretty interesting because you'd actually get guys coming up to you mid-song. You know, and you're halfway through a chorus and you've got this guy in your face standing in front of you and you're like, I can't talk to you right now. I'm, I'm halfway through this chorus, you know. Um, and sometimes you would just have to smile and wave them away if you were, you know, mid-song. But I think, yeah, a lot of liquid courage um, probably assisted some of these men. But, yeah, I did, I did have men coming up to the piano and to the, to the microphone you know, really close and often with a drink in their hand, try and woo me. But yeah, I've, I've had roses given to me mid song randomly. Just, I don't know if these people came with the roses, you know, and just had them or if they, you know, brought them for me. I don't know, but I've had roses given to me, flowers given to me mid song. It happened on my birthday once, which, which was actually pretty, pretty nice. So yeah, but casinos, yeah, they're interesting places. I would normally not perform on the actual gaming floor itself, just a bit outside. But you'd see, you know, people making their way through to the gaming floor and, yeah, I mean, saw some interesting sights, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, it was a great a great time. And I remember those days fondly because, you know, I, I think I'm past, past that point now. I, I don't want to go back to being a cover musician. I think I'm making pretty good traction doing my own stuff. So got to keep moving forward. But yeah, it's nice to think, you know, where you've come from and remember that time. Yeah. When you play at weddings and corporate events, do they hand you a playlist is what we want played? Or do you have a specific playlist for here's one for casinos, haha, one for casinos, one for weddings, one for corporate events, one for other gatherings, or is it the same song list that you play? No different. So depending what the client might want, like let's say it's a um, some kind of corporate function, uh, they might want they might just want sort of almost background music in between speeches. Mm. You know, so you can't mm. be. Sometimes you don't want to be doing these big full on songs because people want to be able to turn to the person next to them and still have a conversation. So I think that's a pretty acquired skill. You know, learning how how present to to make yourself. You know, if you're if you're doing a wedding and it's um, let's say it's the canapes, you know, mm-hmm. people are having something to eat, having a chat. They don't want a full on concert. They just probably want some ambience. Mm-hmm. So knowing when to do that kind of thing versus maybe later in the night when everyone's up and dancing. Yeah. OK, then you've got to put on a bit more of a show. So 
kind of depends uh, on what the client wants, really. I mean, you know, if you get a wedding, they might say, you know, this is our song. You know, the couple might say, this, this is our song. Would you be willing to learn this? So, yeah, you've just got to be flexible, really. And, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's like customer service in, in other fields as well. You've got to make the client happy and give them what they want, don't you? But you can't say customer's always right when it comes to this, no? No, well, yeah, look, there's been some interesting things I've encountered. You know, like people have requested um, songs about, um, like here's an example. So a father-daughter dance at a wedding, they requested a song that probably wasn't appropriate for a father-daughter dance because mm. it had, you know, pretty pretty um, sexual, ex- sexually explicit lyrics. And you go, well, that's not probably appropriate to be, you know, performing that during a father-daughter oh, yeah. dance. Mm-hmm. So you sort of, you got to make them aware because a lot of people, you know, the general public, a lot of people don't actually know what the lyrics of the song are, you know, in detail. They just go, oh, I like that song, you know, I want that song. And you go, well, do you realise what that's about? That's probably not something you want to be dancing, you know, at a father-daughter dance to, you know. So, and they go, oh, wow, I didn't actually realise that song was about that. Okay, let's not do that song then. And they choose something else. So, yeah, being being mindful about meanings of songs, you know, certain lyrics, if it's appropriate in that context and if it's not letting them know. Yeah, I've definitely had to do that before. What's your opener? What would you consider to be a good opening song? Like, everyone, we have Rachel Lincoln here, then Speak, um, and then whatever, and then Toast, and then, boom, you take you ukulele and you, or whatever you're doing at that point. <laughs> When I was in the casino, I had a pretty, pretty set rep list that I would like to do. And I would normally start out the night by singing, funnily enough, it's a pretty big song, but just because I'm so comfortable with the song, I'd actually start with Alicia Keys, If I Ain't Got You. Oh, wow. Excellent. Yeah, as a starter. I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a belter, but I, I think I'm in my element when I'm belting if I'm doing that kind of thing so nice <laughs> or something a bit maybe some Amy Winehouse back to black Valerie that's a great song yeah that's actually my mother's name so, oh really nice yeah yeah I used to sing Valerie a lot I in the band it. that would always get people up and dancing um and if I was doing something with the acoustic duo I'd probably do like an acoustic slow sort of solely version of um back to black really? yeah no, she had some great songs yeah Back to Black, is that a Johnny Cash song, I think? Amy Winehouse had a song called Back to Black. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know about the I'm Johnny thinking Cash, of, Cash version. I'm thinking of Johnny Cash because he was wearing black and he was called The Man in Black, I think. So I thought it was, you know, I don't her know. One was, uh, her one goes, <laughs> We only say goodbye when words are died a hundred times. You go back to her and I go back to I love it. Wow, free <laughs> concert here, everyone. <laughs> I'm not warmed out, so probably not my best love work. But... Rachel, I love it. <laughs> so describe the corporate event. Did you ever perform at maybe uh, big venues like for Apple or for Microsoft? Oh, I wish. What kind of corporate, <laughs> what are corporate um, events to you? Well, see, this is all back in Australia. So in Western Australia, we, we have a lot of mining companies. That's mm-hmm. our state's biggest industry. So um, the mining companies would do, you know, uh, you know, sort of whatever it may be, Christmas party events or all kinds of stuff, but probably not any notable companies like international companies, unfortunately. Yeah, and I haven't really done any of that here in the US because I've been focusing on my own original artistry. So haven't performed for Apple, but hey, never say never. Never say never. But when you were performing at corporate events, how do you charge? Or did they say, we'll pay you this much if you do it here? Or did you say, oh, my rates are this and this and this? Depends if it's been booked through a booking agent or not. So if your agent has found you the gig, they might, because how it works is, you know, companies go, all right, we need, we need some music for our, you know, our Christmas party, whatever it may be. And they'll probably have a regular booking agent that they use. So they'll go to that booking agent and say, hey, we're looking for, you know, male, female duo. You know, we'd like them to sing for, you know, four hours. Um, We'd like sort of background stuff, easy listening. Then that booking agent's going to look on their 
books to see, you know, all right, what male, female duo do we have? Oh, we have, you know, Rachel and Jay, for example. And then they'll probably come to the talent and say, all right, we've got, you know, this gig with a mining company. This is what they want. It's four sets. You know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe I'll quote them X amount. Are you happy with that? And you will say yes or no. Of course, you know, the booking agent will take their commission, whatever that might be. And then you go from there or, you know, but some bookings I made were, you know, um, direct through me to the client. So I might tell the, give, give the client a rough quote, I suppose, and say, you know, it'll be roughly this much um, for, you know, these hours and every, uh, every 45 minutes set, I'm going to do a 15 minute break. And, you know, you could even say, well, I expect to be fed as well at the, at the event, you know, I want a meal included and, yeah, you got you got to hustle in this industry. <laughs> it's like any other business. Oh yeah. So, um, and I know about eating before singing too. I think it's better that I just sing before I eat because I yes. I would eat, for instance, pizza and the cheese, and it gets kind of like phlegmy. And then you're yeah. singing, and you get like this vibrato, which is stuff yeah. that's caused by the cheese. And yeah, I so always that's um, excellent. my attitude was always. It's better to be sort of hungry while you're performing than having that mm-hmm. that sort of issue go on um because you've got you've always got a little bit of adrenaline too and that sort of wards off the hunger so have something to eat afterwards yeah <laughs> wow when you were deciding to focus fully on developing as an original artist why did you start off with electro pop what exactly electro pop and what does it mean in your own words to develop as an original artist firstly i think Developing as an original artist, I think that's when you make the decision of, okay, well, do I want to just be a cover musician and do cover gigs? And that's fine. A lot of people are happy with that. They, that's their bread and butter. You know, they, they have their set rep lists and they do requests and, and that's fine. But I think, you know, a lot of musicians out there, we do want to have a go at, you know, becoming our own, uh, you know, our own original artist and, and you sort of, you sort of have that moment where you go, well, you know, so and so can do it, and if an Adele can do it, and you know, why can't I do it? And you sort of, yeah, make that decision to maybe pursue that. And when I decided that I wanted to have a go at that, I was actually in Sweden at the time. This was back in 2019 when I first started making my own music. And I think, if I think back, I was probably just young and impressionable, and I thought that I had to make pop music or electro dance pop music to be received well um and especially in sweden at that time like avicii had just died so there was a lot of kaigo a lot of avicii on the radio on swedish radio and that was just what was palatable at that time so i thought that i had to do that to be received and the producer that i was working with in sweden he just happened to specialize in that genre as well so i think i was pretty influenced by those two things released a couple of songs that were very like electro pop dance Avicii style but always thought this isn't really my genre like I don't think this really suits me I think lyrically like I was it was fine but the feeling of it wasn't really there like I would listen back to my own work and go yeah it's okay but I don't love it and then you know I I was writing at the same time sort of I guess adult contemporary stuff as well honing my songwriting and then it was only when I came out to Nashville uh, that I discovered, oh, okay, I think this is my genre. Like I'd, I'd always loved country, I'd always loved blues and rock, and country is such a such a special genre in that it, it does encompass or it can encompass so many other genres. You know, you can have elements of blues and rock and soul in country. So, yeah, I think that's when I realised, like, oh, okay, I think country or country pop might be the way to go. Yeah, because... You know, I enjoy telling a story. I think I'm a pretty good lyricist and and country allows for that. You know, the telling of a story, the different stages of the song, you know, the different um, stages of the story. So, yeah, I think think it's a good fit for me. Yeah. You are number one on UK Talk Radio Official Hot 100 Singles Chart with a song, Married in Vegas, 1.5 million Spotify streams. Can you share with us your songwriting process to put Married in Vegas together? And is 
they say that a lot of songs written are from experiences. Was Married in Vegas? Is that what you did about Married in Vegas? <laughs> Look, I actually wrote that song before I'd ever been to Vegas ever in my life. That song was written oh. a couple of years ago in Australia. I'd never been to Vegas. I didn't know much about it. I knew that there was a strip. I knew that there was an MGM Grand Hotel. That was about it. I'd seen Vegas in movies like The Hangover. That was about it. But I had this idea uh, in 2022. I thought, well, there's a bunch of movies about, you know, crazy nights in Vegas. You've got The Hangover. There's, I think there's a movie called What Happens in Vegas. You know, there's, there's movies about crazy nights in Vegas, but there's not really many songs. And I thought about, okay, well, that would make a great song. I thought about a couple, they, well, you know, man and woman, they meet. We don't know if they've met in Vegas that night or if they've come together. We don't, that's up to the listener's interpretation. But it's a couple, um, they're in Vegas. You know, the girl, she's she's got cut off at the bar because she, she's got too drunk, they won't serve her anymore. The guy's been kicked out of the casino because they think he's been, you know, counting cards. So he's been 86th, which is a term that means, you know, kicked out of the casino. Night's young. I didn't even know that. <laughs> the night's young. What do we do now? They can't drink. They can't gamble. And they go, well, I guess we'll go get married then because there's probably not much else to do. So they, they go to the chapel and the line isn't long and, yeah, they get married. <laughs> um, and then they regret it the next day because we were a liquid courage, as you call it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a fun, feel-good song and it's been received well. And I think that there's something to say about the importance of writing music that people want to hear. You know, most music out there is either about finding love or losing it. I think people enjoy hearing a feel good story um, and, and hearing a feel good song. It's not about, you know, being devastated after a breakup or something. So it's a fun, cheesy sort of 1990s Shania Twain kind of style song. It, it was written to be cheesy, but it's meant to be. And I, th- I think I nailed that you know, the right amount of cheese, just enough. Um, so it's meant to be fun, silly, make you feel good. And yeah, that's that's about it, really. <laughs> Did you ever tell anybody that, that you'd never been to Vegas or just me? Oh, I've, I've since been to Vegas after I wrote the song. Yeah. And it was funny because when I, um, when I came to Vegas for the first time, it was strange. I thought, oh, this place looks exactly as I imagined it when I wrote that song you know, and um, like the layout of the, the town and everything. Um, so, yeah, I must have just known something. But, uh, yeah, no, but, it's a good song and, and um, yeah. it's had some good feedback. Mm-hmm. That song won World Songwriting Awards finalist, Best Modern Country Song, a Great American Song Contest finalist pop category, Song of the Year Award semifinalist. It's, it's amazing. Wow, what you did there. Yeah, well, it's cheesy, but, hey, someone's listening to it. <laughs> which is good. <laughs> so tell us about your, so you won a Song of the Year Award for top five finalists for dance category for You've Got to Love You. So can you share with us the songwriting process in that one? That one was personal experience. Tell us. That was written, oh, <laughs> we're going into my diary now. So oh. some of my music is written from experience. Um, and then some isn't like married in Vegas was just an idea that I thought would be cool, but that, yeah. So some, some of my stuff is based on my life and that song you've got to love you was, was a bit of a, um, screw you to someone. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) yeah, it was sort of saying, you know, the gist of it was how, how, yeah, sort, sort of, um, you know, I can't be surprised that you let me down because, you couldn't have loved me when you didn't know how to love yourself. And it was telling that person moving forward before you, you know, get involved with someone else, try to learn to love yourself. So it's sort of a bit of a backhanded, yeah, <laughs> backhanded song. But um, Oh, yeah. I, I have another song that's written about the same experience, which isn't out yet, but I've got the final master and and it's not so screw you, it's more sincere so yeah i kind of felt bad after that one and i won an award and i was like well it can't be a bad song but i I felt bad for the individual that it's about (laughs) so now i've written something a bit nicer for them definitely (laughs) rachel what's going through your head and emotionally and 
and spiritually and physically. You're, look, you're winning all these awards, semi-finalist awards for Out of the Blue, Song of the Year Award for After All. And then now you're for Independent Singer Songwriter Association Award for this year, official finalist for International Female Vocalist of the Year and Rising Star. Wow, what? How are you feeling? Like, wow. Oh, I don't know. I'm I'm always fairly humble, and I don't. I think my whole life I've always put quite a quite a big pressure on myself for whatever it may be. Like at school, I always put pressure on myself, and professionally, you know, as an, as an adult, I still do. And and I I don't think I take the time to stand back and um, acknowledge it. I just keep pushing ahead and go, okay, what's next? What's next? But my horoscope today actually said, take time to, you know, actually just sit back and acknowledge your successes. And I thought, hmm, I should, I should do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I you know, my fam, my, you know, my family are sort of realizing now, you know, they had to eat their words a little bit because they, they said that I couldn't, you know, make a career out of music and I've sort of proved them wrong. So it's funny to see those kind of people in your life, the ones that said you couldn't do it, they're all of a sudden now your biggest supporter and you're going, well, hang on a second, you know, about 10 years ago you told me I couldn't do this and now you're all for it. <laughs> hmm. But, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, parents, they, they just worry about you, don't they, and they just want you to be um, secure and that kind of thing. So I think it's fine now that I've made music my thing because it's working out. So <laughs> then they're happy, right? But. Yeah, I mean, it's good, but I don't really probably take the time to acknowledge the good stuff I'm doing. So thanks for the reminder, I guess. <laughs> I take it your relationship with your parents are pretty good and they loved it when you said, I want to pursue music and not like, I want to be a doctor or a nurse. Yeah. Uh, well, at that time, they sort of did steer me to go and do, I did business, hmm. business law. So I think that they were happy at the time that I was going and doing that, but I think they always probably knew that my heart wasn't fully in that. Mm. And and I think I always hinted that I would probably one day gravitate back towards music, which I now have done. So I think, it, you know, it's if you're meant to do something, you, you end up doing it one way or another. You know, even if you deny yourself doing it for years, you'll find a way back to it. And I think when you allow yourself to give in to that, desire to, to do what you want the path sort of paves its way itself and it, it's easy and, and I read something once and it said you know if, if something is for you it, it will be organic and it will be not easy obviously everything requires hard work but it will it'll repay you like it'll start to love you back you know if you love music it'll and you work hard and you pay your dues, then it, it will eventually start loving you back. So I feel like I'm starting to get some of that love uh, reciprocated. <laughs> wow, Rachel, this is all amazing. Your life so far is what you want it to be. Um, how do you deal with your mental health? What are some of the things that you do to prevent you from going insane and crazy? Well, since I've been over here in the US, I've had to be mindful about mental health because obviously I came out here on my own. I knew no one here. Um, you know, my family are on the other side of the world and, and my friends and everything. So it was a little bit challenging. Well, actually, no. I was, when I first came out, everything was novel. Everything about the US was a novelty. Um, you know, it was like, wow, everything's new, getting settled and that kind of thing. So I was fine. But then when I sort of got settled and, um, you know, it became the norm, the new norm, I think I started to realise the absence of my social life and, and it, you know, on, on some days family and friends did seem, you know, quite a long way away, the ones back home. So it's been, it's been challenging just, just um, staying strong and not, not packing it in and saying, oh, I'm going home, I can't do it. You know, because I, I made some sacrifices to come out to the US and and I knew that, you know, people had said to me, you know, whatever in life that you're trying to pursue, you know, a new business or a career or whatever, you do have to pay your dues. And I thought I thought that if I made some sacrifices before I came, then maybe the universe would 
acknowledge them and, and help me out when I, you know, got to the US and, and yeah, I, I don't know. You, some days you go, what am I doing? Like, I should just go back to Australia and, you know, I've, I've given it a go. And, and then you go, no, just hang, hang in there a little bit longer. Keep going, keep going, keep going. So yeah, it's been challenging, but just having regular calls with people back home and remembering why I'm, why I'm here and why I'm doing it, you know, that, that's the reminder and you, you just keep going, you know? And do you get a chance to go back to visit? I went, I've been back once. I went back in January cause my grandmother um, was uh, pretty, pretty sick. So I, I did go back um, and saw her one last time and, and I timed it pretty well because I saw her, I think it was like the 1st of February and then she passed away like the following week. So I just had arrived back in the U S and she passed away. So I mm. timed it pretty perfectly, but it's just, it's so far down there. Like even from the West coast, you know, you it's about like from LAX, you're looking at about 13 hours to Sydney or Melbourne. Mm. And then I'm actually on the total other side. So I'm in, you know, Perth, which is another five hours flight from there. So it takes you a, a good day, you know, 24 hours plus to get, get there. And then my hometown is like a five hour drive from the nearest airport. So it, it's, it's pretty remote. I know what you mean. Um, yeah. Be- yeah. Because I, like, apart from Bailey, who's uh, in Perth, she's 12 hours ahead. I've had people from Brisbane, Sydney, and there's like three or four other time zones in Australia. And I have to ask them, okay, you're from Australia, but where? Sydney? Oh, then you're 17 hours ahead. Where are you from? Yeah. Oh, you're, you're from Brisbane. Oh, so you're 14 hours ahead. So I had to, so, but eventually I, I'm got it all you know, figure it out. Yeah. And I don't think people realize, you know, well, especially in the U S I don't think Americans realize that Australia is actually as big as the U S you know, mm. if you fly from Perth to Sydney, that's like flying LA to New York. That's a, you know, that's a five hour flight. And if you, if you take the outline of Australia and like superimpose it onto a map of the U S like it, it covers it. <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah, a long way, but thank goodness for, you know, airplanes and, and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I'm, while I was researching you, I couldn't find anywhere. It says, oh, and da, 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 blah, 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 this and that. Rachel this. And Rachel also knows how to have a horse, how to ride a horse because she's got her own horse name. <laughs> Do you, have you learned, how to, <laughs> have you learned how to ride a horse? Oh, I've ridden horses. I wouldn't say that I'm like an avid horse rider or anything. No. Like, I don't think I could just jump on one bareback and gallop off but i've been on them (laughs) my my family back in australia had a beef cattle farm so grew up around a lot of cows my auntie and uncle still have a winery down there in my hometown so grew up around like agriculture and cows but not really horses Mm. wow now that you're a country girl and you're in the state (laughs) people automatically think rachel and then here's a horse because they kind of like it's synonymous with with yeah, country I guess singers so. and horses. Country, country singers yeah, and horses. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, uh, when I was a kid, I wasn't one of those horse girls with the weird horse fetish or anything. <laughs> I mean, nothing against horses. I just haven't really had much ex- exposure around them. But, you know, maybe I'll, you know, never say never. It's never too late. Maybe I'll take some horse riding lessons and next time we speak, I'll have my own ranch and 20 horses. Who knows? <laughs> Why not? can do whatever you want, you know? Yeah. We never know what's around the corner. That's for sure. Yeah. What of the influential people or mentors guided you during the ages, early stages of your journey? Um, I would say, like, if I think back to the beginning, back in Perth, um, probably my, my duo partner. So Jay Weston um, was the male singer of, the duo so he was the other half so yeah I think I think he definitely took me under his wing and and um you know uh, just thinking now back to times that we performed you know I mean it's not all glamorous and great like in the casino I remember we had one night where there was like an, an older man and I think he thought that our music our speakers were too loud and and we didn't have control over it you know like it was the house system and you know, the sound guy had control over it. We, we couldn't even change it if we wanted to. But this this patron came up and actually 
tried to like shake and like dismantle some of our equipment. And I was like, it was very confrontational because we we were mid song and this guy just came up and was yelling. I think he was probably drunk, but he, you know, he said, I don't like this song, you know, sing something different. And it was shaking out like our music gear and like really in our face. And it was just really, really unexpected and, and it kind of shook me and I ended up in tears actually but <laughs> but I remember um Jay at that time he you know he consoled me and he said it's okay you know you're doing great that's just one unhappy patron among all the people that come and give us the good feedback so you know don't take it to heart and that kind of thing so yeah I think I think he definitely had a um played a big part when I first started performing like ever um and then in the US it's sort of been I've sort of had to figure things out for myself, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he's the one that comes to mind, though. Not, any, not your parents or anybody else in your family that might be encouragement to you as well? Oh, I mean, they're not really music-minded, my parents. They don't really know anything about the industry or, or anything like that. They're not artistic people themselves, so... Not really. General encouragement just to keep pushing and keep going is but probably my cousin back home. We call that like, pretty much every day and and that's um a nice little piece of home that keeps me going. So close friends and things, but yeah, not really um they're not really like music minded, but but that's okay, you know, they don't have to be. Oh wow. But, so you yeah. so you're an only child I, I guess. I have a brother, oh. he lives in Thailand. He's a um, bit older than me. I actually lived in Thailand myself. Um, I was a high school teacher. Oh, nice. Um, before I, yeah, this is after I finished university. I wow. you know, was probably having a midlife, a quarter life crisis because I knew that I didn't want to go work in a corporate job. And I was like, well, you know, what do I do? And I went off to Thailand and became an English teacher and um, taught up there for like a year, wow. which was great. Really great. Really great experience. But yeah, I just have the one sibling. He lives in Bangkok. So I take it like you have some fans of yours who love your music, were former students, I guess? Yeah, yeah, I, I do have. Um, it's funny, like when I look at my um, my Spotify, my back end, you know, you can see all your statistics and your demographics and that. I do have a pretty large chunk that comes from Thailand and I'm like, I bet that's all my old students. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it, it's been great. You know, it's it's – and that's what I mean about you have these moments where you go, oh, what am I doing? What is this all for? You know, I'm never going to make it. You know, I'm missing out on so much back home. I'm, you know, I'm sacrificing so much and I feel like I'm not making progress. And then you have days where you feel the opposite. And, you know, I've had strangers reach out to me, you know, in rural Texas say, oh, you know, hey, I follow your music and, you don't know me, but I know you and I would love something with your signature on it. And you're like, <laughs> someone wants my autograph? What? Like, <laughs> what the hell? You know, like, wow. and, nice. and I do it, you know, I answer them. Yeah, I answer them. And, you know, and I, I'll print something out and sign it or, you know, I'll send them something in the mail and take it down to the post office and send it off. And, you know, they go, oh, thank you so much. I got it. And then, you, you know, you feel good and you're like, okay, well, maybe I'll keep going. You know, someone out there is listening. <laughs> well, so what happens if you like uh, you end up hitting a wall? You have like the, uh, a wall, and you have to navigate through it. So, what do you do? Like, it could be like music. It could be that you had to have a gig, but some members can show up, or you got sick that day. Like, how do you navigate through them? I don't know. I mean, I've always been told throughout my life that I've I'm very resourceful. People tell me like, oh, you always seem to like land on your feet no matter what happens. So like if, if I somehow, <laughs> yeah, if I somehow get myself into a dicey situation, like I can get myself out of it pretty quick. Not that I do often, but I mean like, you know, I always seem to find a way. I, I don't know if you've ever seen Suits, the um, the TV show Suits. I have, have, yeah. In fact, I, I'm familiar yeah. with, with Megan. You know. So... Yeah, right. So there's a um, a character, well, like one of the main characters on there, Harvey Specter. So being, I, you know, I did do business law. So, you know, I do have an interest in that as well. And I was really into that show, Suits. But one of the main characters, Harvey Specter, he, he said something, um, a quote, and it, it always stuck with me. And I sort of, 
I sort of um, have taken it on board. Well, he said two things, actually. He said, like, you got to make your own luck in life. And I think I'd do that. But he also said in one of the episodes, he said, like, when you think that you're in like a really bad situation and there's no way out, there is a way out. And there's probably about 167 ways out. You just got to figure them out. Think, you know, you got to think about what are they? Yeah. So there's definitely been times, you know, in my life where I've gone, oh my God, oh my goodness, how do I solve this or how do I get out of this or whatever? And I think about that, that episode and I go, well, Harvey Specter said that when someone puts a gun to your head, there's, you know, there's 167 ways to get out of it. So you just got to think about, you just need one. You don't need all 167 of them. You just need one solution and roll with that. So yeah, I don't know, just being creative and being resourceful and thinking outside the box, I guess. That's pretty yeah. powerful, Rachel. I love that. <laughs> How we specter. Maybe I should watch Suits now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a great show. Do you have a special um, collaboration you like to have with, I'm not talking about collaboration with Howard Spector, but um, <laughs> an, another musician out there that you like to collab with? Not yet. I mean, I do have some dream artists that, you know, would be like on my dream list of people to perform with or write with. Maybe one day, you know, I'll get lucky enough. Um, not really, though. Not at the moment. Wow. I really love your life. Let's switch. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> do you, uh, I ask everyone this all the time. Well, not all the time, but I ask you, uh, do you have any items on your bucket list that you want to share with us and some that you're most excited about accomplishing mm. in your life? I've crossed off some of them already. Um, I always yeah. wanted to see the Northern Lights in the Arctic Circle, and I, nice. I did that. Musically, I I do. Um, one of them, which is probably, you know, a stock standard thing to say is, I want to win a Grammy. So that's probably one of them. <laughs> I know it. Sure, cross that I don't. Out. I don't really care for the paperweight, but it's more just about, you know, doing the speech or whatever, but the acknowledgement, I guess. I'll be there all the way to um, encourage you and root you on. Rachel, Rachel, I want to hold that thing. Cause I, I, I'm just like, I've seen him win Grammys and I know it's like crystal, yeah. I think. And I want to know like yeah. the weight of it and how heavy it is. And I've had yeah, it. Me awesome too. I mean, another thing would be the star on, um, on the boulevard. That'd be cool. But apparently, yeah. So with, I thought that the way to get one of those is actually different than I thought. I think it's, um, I think it's something like the fans can actually organize that. It's not like you don't get it. There's no quotas you've got to reach to get one. It's, yeah, it's sort of done a bit more, I don't know, having a number one song on the Billboard chart. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I haven't really thought about that. I have to, I have to get back to you on that. Yes, please. What about reading? Like, do you like reading books? Probably don't as, I probably don't read as much as I should or as much as I used to. I know that they say reading is like really good for you and your mind and that, but no, I have to admit that I don't read much. Okay. No, because I listen I... to podcasts and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. Also, yes. And no, because I'm asking you because, well, not only what I wanted to know what you read recently, but when you read and you're really reading the, all the words and everything, it reminds you that when you're putting lyrics on a paper or the song that you're writing, I don't know whether you start with the melody first and then the lyrics or both, but when you're writing the lyrics, do you ever get to the point where you're like, that's not right, try this one? How long does it you think it takes you to come um... up with a perfect set of... Lyrics. Well, my general process of a song is I actually do um, lyrics first before melody. So what I'll do is I'll probably get inspired by a phrase or mm -hmm. like a sentence and I go, oh, that, you know, that, that's a great line. That's, that would make a great line in a song. And then I'll build an idea around that, build a theme around that, build a general story around that. And then I'll sort of get the hook maybe like, you know, get the structure down. So I might map it out like verse one, verse two, chorus, 
there's three, there's four chorus, bridge, chorus, chorus, outro. Then I have my skeleton and then I can start writing my verses once I've got my hook down. And then the actual, you know, uh, the final melody would, would come last for me. So I'm, I'm a lyricist before like a melody creator, I suppose. And I, that probably comes from probably like school. Like in school, I was always good at like English and English literature and good at coming up with yeah. like symbolism yeah. and and similes and, you know, metaphors and all that kind of thing. So I think that's pretty inextricably linked, you know. So maybe, yeah, being like a good writer means you're a good songwriter, means you could be a good author. You know, it's all it's all linked, I think. Yeah, being a good storyteller. I like that answer, Rachel. I do agree with you uh, because I'm thinking, like, like, what do you want your fans or people listening to music, what do you want them to take away from them? Well, it's not about, it's not about, you know, putting a song out and going, well, this, this is my experience. This is Rachel Lincoln's experience. This happened to me. This is my breakup. No, you've got to write something that people can, they can um, project their own life onto it and make their own meaning of it. You know, you might sing about um, a boy and a girl breaking up, but you've got to write it in a way that people can put themselves in that character's shoes and go, yep, yeah, that's me and I can relate to that. And, and you know, you want, to, you want to write music and lyrics that get the listener to think about their own life, and you know you want it to evoke memories in them you want it to you want to elicit feelings from them you've got to write stuff that will will bring a reaction in your listener to draw them in and, and make them a fan so i'm determined to make music that is going to be you know potentially the soundtrack to people's lives you know because i i've got my shirt on now i've got one of my john mayer shirts on but But John Mayer, like, Mm -hmm. he is an example of, you know, an artist that, you know, his music was and continues to be the soundtrack to my life. I remember, you know, one of my first breakups, there's a song that John Mayer has written and and I listened to it then and, you know, it it gave me solace then and, and I've listened to it 10 years on and it gives you new meaning and it gives you a new message and new solace. So... Yeah, timeless music that people can relate to, that they can, you know, think about in terms of their own story and their own life and that they get, yeah, meaning from, I guess. Wow. So. I like how you said the soundtrack of your life. If you could have any actor, musician, whoever narrate your life, who would it be? Um, oh, good question. Uh, I mean... Morgan Freeman would be pretty cool. He's a great the narrator. But... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, probably. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Wouldn't we all? Or um or David Attenborough. Oh nice. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do have a dog who's pretty um pretty sassy and you know, she's a little a little sassy madam, so I think David Attenborough would have some comments to make on her. Yeah. <laughs> and Patrick Stewart would narrate mine because I have a black cat. Well so Patrick Stewart would... Oh yeah. Patrick Stewart would probably have a lot to say about a black cat. Well, the Halloween cat. <laughs> well, yeah. some people say, some people believe that a black cat crossing your path is unlucky and some believe it's lucky. So it depends who you ask, you know? I know. And every time, it's like 3 a.m., she's sitting there looking at me. I'm like, okay, Hannah, um, when did you want to kill me? Because I'm on my way to work. You know, you know it's like it's a black well, cat. Well, I am. Um, you probably already know this, but, you know, they there's some study being done and it says, like, if you pass away, like, in your house, it's only, like, I think it's a couple of days and then your cat will start eating you. <laughs> the cat will start eating its owner. Hannah, so, um, I taste awful. <laughs> you won't like that. No, I'm, I'm off. I taste really bad, okay? Just so you know, don't... I'm, you know, and I'm and pe- people... <laughs> People that love dogs will say, oh, cats are, you know, I'm not a cat person because if I died, it would start eating me in two days. But I read something the other day that countered that and said, there's new studies being done that said a dog might actually eat you before the cat would. So, yeah. Well, (laughs) this author wrote this book called uh, about 
cats taking over the world and killing their owners. I can't remember what it's called, but he wrote a whole book on it. Yeah. But Hannah, just so you know, I'm, uh, are you a good girl? I hope you're good. Girl. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you anything you want. Just don't eat me when I die. No. Keep her well fed. Yeah. <laughs> keep her well fed, definitely. Oh, I do. I keep her well fed. Oh. I'm asking her, please lose some weight there. So, <laughs> but also during life, I want to ask that you, you must have made a lot of mistakes um, and challenges. What's your biggest failure that taught you something valuable about your life? Hmm. Um, I've, I've lived my life so far saying I don't have any regrets, but I have an inkling that one might be maybe on the horizon, which, which isn't a regret as much as, um, it's maybe just more an acknowledgement of, um, did you ever see that movie Sliding Doors? With I Gwyneth did. Paltrow? I loved it. You had like two different versions. Yeah. I loved mm. it. Of Gwyneth Paltrow it's, and, and she spoke in this really excellent uh, English accent that they taught her. Some linguists taught her to do that. So I loved it. Yeah, the gist of the movie is is pretty much you know all these little moments and the butterfly effect and and how that can mm -hmm. lead to how your life ends up, right? So in one version of the story, she um, it's all about getting the train or just missing the train. Mm -hmm. So in the version where she gets on the train, her life. I think it turns out like terrible and I think she even ends up homeless. And then in the version of the story where she um, doesn't make it or sorry, or vice versa, the life turns out, you know, really successful. So sorry, that truck outside's back. Hmm. Um, I think the decision to make the sacrifice I did when I came to the U S so I, I was at a stage in my life where if I wanted to, I probably could have settled down and I probably had the right, sorry, if this truck is making noise, yeah, I was at the stage where if I wanted to settle down and, and have a family life and that kind of thing, I, I probably had found like the perfect person. But part of me thought, I, I don't know if I can fully commit to that life because I don't want to one day end up, you know, thinking, oh, what if, what if I had gone and pursued my music? And, you know, I wouldn't want to regret um, or resent um, that person and, you know, children we might have had together or whatever. But but yeah, I think I had to make a pretty difficult decision um, a couple of years ago, and um, you know, I had I had to either choose that life or choose pursuing pursuing my music. And as I, I said earlier, you know, you have to pay your dues. And I thought at the time maybe this is what I have to sacrifice to to have success in in my musical career. So I sort of offered that to the gods, and I said, look, I'm willing to. I'm willing to sacrifice my personal life for my career. So please make it work out. <laughs> so that's probably, um, you know, a very difficult, the, probably the most difficult choice I've had to make that I, I made the choice and um, you got to live with the consequences and you just got to hope that, you know, the sacrifice will pay off. Yeah. Are you, when you got into music, you bought that, ukulele of the money you won in that song contest when you were 12 did you you made a decision to become a pop artist country were you also prepared to fail and what was your backup plan well yeah i mean you only fail if you stop right if you never stop you just you keep on keeping on so well, I mean, and that's why I, I did go to college and I did do, quote unquote, a real subject. Backup plan will just be, I'll just go get an office job in corporate law. I did do, do well at, and even in my personal life, you know, I've utilised that knowledge and filed suits on my own and, and done things, you know, so it's been, it's been useful. So I think that would be my backup plan. I would probably just go back home, get a job, you know, in that kind of, in a business law kind of role. Or I might go back to Thailand and just go back and be a high school teacher and live in the rice paddies. <laughs> you don't know what tomorrow so I've got will a couple bring, options. Rachel. No, yeah. you don't. But um, well, it's all part of it. So, yeah. It's well, part of the journey. we wish you all. Yeah, we wish you all the success. <laughs> Before I go, I just yeah. sorry to interrupt you there. If I can, if I can take a moment, yeah. I just want to do a bit of a plug. So, go um, ahead. 
you may have read about this on my website. I don't know if you can see that. This is my latest EP in CD form. So got some pretty great news with this one. So um, I've partnered up with um, Knowledge Kids Foundation and Elite Island Resorts. So the fundraiser that's happening is this. Um, if you buy a copy of the CD, um, it says here that 100% of the proceeds are going to the charity. And the other cool thing is it's a tax deduction. And if you buy the CD, you automatically go into the draw to win a resort stay at one of the Elite Island Resorts locations across the Caribbean and Panama. So that's pretty exciting. There's information on my website about that. Um, so not only do you get a copy of my CD, that's tax deductible and you go into the draw to win a resort stay. So why would you not want to do it? It's for charity. So yeah. Yes, everyone, <laughs> Rachel Lincoln's music. Thank you very much for that CD promo, everyone. Make sure you Thanks. go to her Thanks website for and do that plug. pick it up. And I'm not promising you that she'll sign it, but she's going to sign mine. You. Um, <laughs> so for anyone that's all her music to get the CD, sorry. Yeah. Anyone that's interested to get the CD and go into the draw to win that trip, just head to rachellincoln.country and there's information on there how to get the CD and you'll be entered into the draw. That'd be great. Everyone, Rachel's music will be on Spotify, Music, Deezer, and Reverberation as well. Um, and before we leave, we like to ask you to, can you give a piece of advice to the up and coming Rachel Lincolns out there. Ooh. Um, okay. Here's, here's probably something that I should have been told like 10 years, 10 or 15 years ago, just do whatever you want. If you, if you, you know, if you think that you need to go and study something you don't want to, because that's what adults are saying you need to do. They're wrong. Like, you know, the, the older you get, you realise that your parents and your teachers and all these other adults around you, they don't really know what's going on either. Everyone's just winging life. And, you know, if you're young and you're, you're in school and you're trying to decide what you want to study and, and you're interested in the arts, just go for it. Because if it's meant for you, like, you will find a career in it one way or another. You will be able to make a business that involves that somehow or you'll be, you'll be able to combine your interests and your passions and you will be able to make money. So trust me, like I'm, I'm proof of it. I was told I couldn't. I went and did something at university that I didn't really want to do. And I've reverted back to my love and my passion and, and it's my bread and butter now. So I'm living proof that you can do it. So to all the kids out there that might want to pursue something in the arts, but you're being told it's not real, that's rubbish. Just go for it. You'll be fine. <laughs> We really yeah. appreciate that, Rachel. Thank you for that word of advice to up and coming Rachel Lincolns out there. We wish you all <laughs> the success. And Thanks so much. Thank you for that. You're very welcome. Okay, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much for tuning in. Rachel Don't Lincoln. Don't forget to get your CDs and try and win that resort stay. <laughs> Say that again. Go. I said, don't forget to... Don't forget to head to my website, grab a copy of this CD, which is going to charity, and you could maybe win that resort stay. There you go, everyone. Rachel Lincoln, out. Oh.